What would you do if your world suddenly crumbled around you, leaving you stranded on an uninhabited island? How would you cope with the isolation, the uncertainty, and the looming specter of survival after being abandoned on a desolate patch of land? Step into the shoes of Alexander Selkirk, a Scottish privateer cast away for an astounding four years and four months, whose real-life adventure inspired the classic tale of Robinson Crusoe. In the middle of a routine ship resupply on the Juan Fernandez archipelago, Selkirk faced a pivotal decision. A dangerously leaky ship demanded immediate attention, and he insisted on repairs before setting sail again. Little did he know that this insistence would lead to an unimaginable fate. In a desperate attempt, Selkirk threatened to stay on the island if his request for repairs was ignored. Sadly, the captain chose to forsake him, and he was left to watch the ship sail away into the unknown. Now put yourself in his shoes, stranded with minimal supplies, no companionship except the haunting echoes of the waves, and the uncertainty of rescue hanging in the air. Can you fathom the mental and physical challenges he would endure? This wasn't just a hypothetical scenario for Alexander Selkirk. It was his grim reality for 52 months. Join us as we embark on a journey through Selkirk's extraordinary tale of survival against all odds. Stick around until the end and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to never miss out on more incredible historical tales. We're all familiar with Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, a timeless literary classic. What some people might not know is that the story was inspired by the real-life adventures of a certain Scottish privateer. When Defoe published his novel in 1719, many noticed that the main character resembled Alexander Selkirk. In one of the book's illustrations, there's a man on an island, dressed in hairy goatskins and looking inland barefoot, quite reminiscent of Selkirk, despite their different geographical locations. The novel draws from various survival stories known to Defoe at that time. But it's clear that Selkirk's tale played a significant role, given its immense popularity back then. So, who exactly was this intriguing figure who captured Defoe's imagination? Before Alexander Selkirk became the famous survivor we know today, his early life in Fife, Scotland, hinted at the daring and unpredictable journey ahead. Born in 1676, he was the seventh son of a tanner, and his mother thought he had special gifts following Scottish superstition. He started working alongside his father as a shoemaker from a young age, but his playful behavior often got him into trouble. His rebellious side showed at 17 when he faced charges for misbehavior in a church. A seemingly harmless incident of accidentally drinking salt water took a serious turn when he almost shot his younger brother in a fit of rage. This episode, a sign of his impulsive nature, could have landed him in court, but Selkirk managed to avoid the consequences. When he clashed with church authorities again, he saw a chance to break free from his restricted life. Instead of choosing a common path like the Navy or merchant life, Alexander ventured into the world of pirates and privateers in the South Seas. During the late 17th and early 18th centuries, privateering was a common practice, especially during times of conflict. Governments issued licenses, known as letters of mark, to private ship owners, allowing them to act as quasi-naval forces. These privateers played a significant role in naval warfare, harassing and capturing enemy ships to disrupt trade and weaken the opposing side. In 1703, during England's conflict with Spain, ships that could disrupt Spanish operations were commissioned by the British Navy. This period was the golden age of piracy, offering opportunities for substantial financial gain, albeit accompanied by high risks. As time passed, Alexander participated in several expeditions and ascended to the role of navigator. Most of his missions were located in South America, targeting Spanish forces. He later became a member of the crew on Cinque Ports, a companion ship for Captain William Dampier's St. George. Things quickly went south when the original captain of Cinque Ports died from scurvy, and Lieutenant Thomas Stradling took over. But Thomas and Captain William didn't get along. Three quarters of the crew nearly mutinied because of their constant fighting. They had a tough year, even failing to capture a French warship and getting noticed by enemy navies. Eventually, in 1704, after a huge argument over a ship they had captured, the two captains decided they'd had enough. They went separate ways, and Alexander stuck with Thomas, thinking he was the better choice. Unfortunately, Alexander and Captain Stradling frequently clashed as well. 
Captain Stradling, who was seven years younger, acted a bit too proud. Despite their disagreements, they still worked together and managed to take on many enemy ships successfully. However, their ship eventually suffered wear and tear and needed to dock at a nearby island for restocking and repairs. The Juan Fernandez Islands, situated about 400 miles west of Chile, became their temporary haven. Before they could set sail again, Alexander and Captain Stradling engaged in a heated debate about whether to depart immediately or wait and conduct more extensive repairs on the ship. Captain Stradling was keen to leave the island, fearing the possibility of being discovered, even though there was no visible presence of others on the island. He was not entirely certain they were alone and wanted to avoid any potential ambush by enemies, especially when their defenses were down. Conversely, Alexander advocated for an extended stay to ensure the ship was adequately repaired. He believed that the vessel was not in a condition to withstand a long journey and required more time for repairs. He was convinced that the ship would eventually sink, so in an effort to save his own life, he chose to stay behind on the main island of the Juan Fernandez archipelago, the Masa Tierra. What would you have done in this situation? Alexander attempted to persuade other crew members to remain with him on the island, warning them about the dangers of sailing with a compromised ship. Unfortunately, in the end, no one chose to join him. They considered it too risky to stay on an island with no certainty of when the next ship would arrive or if there would even be one. Therefore, they preferred to take their chances sailing on the ship rather than being left behind. When Alexander realized that he would be alone, he changed his mind and wanted to rejoin the crew. However, Captain Stradling pointed a gun at him, preventing him from boarding the ship. Before sailing away, they left him with a few essential items for survival. A Bible, a hatchet, a musket, some provisions, and clothing. But having these supplies didn't make being marooned any easier. At first, he sat on his chest, staring at the sea, thinking Thomas would turn back and rescue him. Days passed, and he hardly ate or slept. When hunger finally kicked in, he wandered the shore, catching shellfish and eating fish that washed up. He stuck close to the beach, hoping someone would sail by. But days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months. By October, spring had arrived in the southern hemisphere, but Alexander was oblivious to the blooming flowers around him. These initial months were tough. He'd always been around people, part of a big family or his extended ocean family. Now he was more isolated than almost anyone in history struggling to cope. Dark thoughts occasionally crept in. But his faith, rooted in his early years in the church, came to his rescue. He reframed his situation, thinking that, instead of being abandoned in a desolate place, God had left him on an island with the resources to survive. For about nine months, he survived on seafood and seals, sticking to the beach. But as fall came, the beach became a mating ground for sea lions, making them aggressive and hard to avoid. Winter approached and the island's temperature could drop to 48 degrees Fahrenheit, 9 degrees Celsius, bringing frost and more rain. Realizing he needed shelter, Alexander moved into the forest for the first time. There he found pimento trees and used his tools to build a hut for sleeping. He also gathered tall grass from the hills, dried it out, and used it to thatch a roof for the hut. To make things more comfortable, he crafted a bed from more pimento trees and covered it with the bedding he brought. Finally, he had a refuge from the harsh elements, a place to call home on the desolate island. The island had a subtropical Mediterranean climate with temperatures consistently ranging between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. This climate was ideal, as it meant he didn't have to worry excessively about extreme cold in the winter or extreme heat in the summer. Although the island provided all the necessities for human survival, Alexander faced several challenges. For instance, without refrigeration, he couldn't preserve the meat from the animals he hunted. This attracted multiple rats, which often bit chunks off the meat. When he tried to drive them away with a large branch, they would return at night and attack him while he slept. No matter what he tried, the rats persisted. Then, a brilliant idea struck him. He realized the rats weren't locals. They'd hitched a ride on ships. And what keeps rats in check? Cats! Lucky for him, the island had loads of feral cats that had arrived the same way. Alexander managed to find some kittens raised them himself. The cats became his night guards, keeping rats at bay. 
Sacrificing some meat for the cats was a small price to pay for a good night's sleep. He soon had a growing cat family, which kept him company. Sleeping better at night, he started reciting psalms from his Bible, a routine that grounded him and helped him fight off loneliness and depression. Then came the second hut, his kitchen, where he boiled water and prepared the animals he caught. With fire-resistant wood, he crafted a spit for cooking. Fortunately, he knew how to start a fire from his childhood. He likely employed a method called friction fire, where he rapidly rubbed one stick against another to generate heat. By placing one stick on a flat surface and quickly twirling the other between your hands against it, you can create friction that produces hot embers. These embers, when placed on a bed of dry, flammable materials like leaves or twigs, would eventually ignite, offering vital warmth and means to cook food on the uninhabited island. Selkirk's resourcefulness in mastering such essential survival techniques was crucial for facing the challenges of isolation. Also, his trusty kettle played a crucial role in boiling meat and making butchering easier. Back to the mainstream of events, building on his success with cats, Alexander tamed wild goats, keeping them close for milk and as a backup meat source. But his main food supply was wild goats he chased down on foot. Surprisingly, the island had veggies like pimento peppers, parsnips, radishes, watercress, and native fruits. He even found a cabbage palm that served as bread. Sometimes he'd treat himself to a large crayfish boiled with veggies he foraged. After about 18 months, he settled into his island life. With a variety of food and mind-engaging activities, he even noticed the blooming spring flowers. Knowing the island like the back of his hand, he became fitter than ever. Initially, he could only catch younger goats, but with time, he became swift and strong enough to take on the big ones. Alexander was thriving, adapting to his wild surroundings and making the best of his marooned situation. However, familiarity can sometimes lead to carelessness, and Alexander's confidence almost cost him his life. One day, he climbed a cliff to catch a large adult goat, not realizing the height until he stretched out, lost his balance, and tumbled backward onto his back, falling directly onto the goat. Bruised and out of breath, he lay there for days, probably with cracked ribs. The goat, in an unexpected turn, played a role in saving him by breaking his fall. Alexander Selkirk was lucky that he managed to recover completely, but in a more unfortunate situation. He might have dealt with complications such as infections or respiratory issues, lasting pain, stiffness, or deformities in the ribcage. After recovering, Alexander pondered the harsh reality that if he had died, there would be nothing left of him. Creatures on the island might have consumed him, leaving no trace. Worried even his cats might devour him, he began carving his name and the date he was stranded on trees, a makeshift tombstone in case the worst happened. Living on the island took a toll on his clothes and bedding, wearing them out completely. But resourceful as ever, he turned to his goat companions and his skills as a tanner, skinning goats, sewing pelts together, and using leather strips and a sharp needle from his navigation kit. He fashioned blankets, pants, a jacket, and a hat to endure the island's elements. His old bed linen transformed into new shirts. Even his tools began to wear out, but the beach provided unexpected replacements. Once, he found two large metal hoops, transforming them into knives. Whenever he needed something, Alexander's resourcefulness always came through. Despite finding a certain contentment on the island, he grappled with loneliness and yearned for home and human company. Daily, he scanned the horizon for distant ships, hoping for rescue. He knew that there had been others who had stopped on the island before, as evidenced by signs of previous visits such as broken wooden barrels, torn bushes, and branches. Even the feral goats he found in the interior of the island were likely left behind by previous visitors and had since repopulated. This knowledge gave him hope that a ship's crew might one day stop by the island, either to explore it or to restock supplies. And that's precisely what happened. Several years into his isolation, a ship anchored near the island. He rushed to the beach and waved two large leaves to attract their attention. However, Alexander made a critical error in not checking the flags of the ships before revealing himself. It turned out that the ships were Spanish. As soon as he realized this, he hid in the tall grass, observing them from a distance. When the Spanish ship docked, its crew, armed with guns, hurriedly began searching the island. They knew they had seen a man and were now looking for him. 
They even fired shots randomly into the bushes in an attempt to scare him out. The search extended deeper into the island where they found his hut, Bible, and other belongings. Upon discovering the Bible, which was written in English, they identified him as an enemy. The search went on for several hours until they eventually gave up, realizing that he was alone and that it wasn't worth their time to continue pursuing him. Once the coast was clear, Alexander returned to his hut, realizing how close he came to losing everything. Faced with the constant threat of discovery, he decided to hide whenever another ship approached, ensuring the safety of his solitary island existence. Back in England, four long years after Alexander was marooned, Captain William found himself on a new assignment. Unable to secure command of his own ship in England due to his notorious failures, he served as a pilot on the privateer vessel Duke, commanded by Captain Woods Rogers. In January of that year, the Duke and its sister ship, the Duchess, approached the familiar island of Mas a Tierra. Low on supplies, the crew saw the island as a potential source to restock. William recalled the events of four years prior, how his former partner had betrayed him and sailed to Mas a Tierra to repair his boat. Approaching the island cautiously, the Duke dropped anchor and the crew planned to assess their needs before heading to shore in the morning. During the night, they spotted a fire on the shore. Unsure of its exact location in the darkness, they decided to remain silent to avoid alerting potential threats. By morning, it became evident that the fire was indeed on the island. A small crew was sent to investigate, and as they neared the shore, they heard cries and saw a wild-looking man running towards them, waving a small white flag. The man was Alexander Selkirk, who had spotted the English ships the day before, and, excitedly realizing he might finally be rescued, had lit a fire to signal them. Gathering wood, he created a beacon and kept it burning all night, also preparing goats to feed the crew. When the boats approached at noon, Alexander ran to the shore, embraced the crew, and struggled to express himself verbally. Having not spoken to another human for so long, he found it challenging to form complete sentences. Initially hesitant to board the ship when he saw Captain William, Alexander's last memories of him and his leadership made him prefer staying on the island. It took the captain explaining what had happened in England for Alexander to agree to come aboard. Alexander, once considered the finest crew member of the Cinque Ports by William, spent 10 days helping the crew repair and refit their ships. He hunted for fresh food, delayed the consumption of the remaining ship rations, and received fresh clothes and shoes, though he found walking in shoes clumsy at first. As they departed, the captain, impressed by Alexander's newfound skills and patience acquired during his years on the island, appointed him as the second mate, outranking even William. Alexander's journey from marooned castaway to second mate marked the incredible end of his isolation on Masa Tierra. After his remarkable rescue, Alexander Selkirk quickly returned to the world of privateering, seamlessly slipping back into a life at sea as if the isolation on Masa Tierra had never happened. For the next four years, he sailed with the Duke, causing as much trouble for the Spanish as possible. Finally, on October 1st, 1711, eight years after Thomas had originally abandoned him, Alexander reached England. During his time on the Duke, he amassed a considerable fortune of $800, equivalent to several hundred thousand U.S. dollars today. But what happened to the original crew? Did they make the right decision when they set sail on the leaky ship? Captain Thomas Stradling, the man who had left Alexander behind, faced a harsher fate. His ship was later found off the coast of Peru. Alexander's concerns about the ship's condition had been valid. It eventually succumbed to its damages, and the crew was forced to dock along the Peruvian coastline. Unable to repair the ship in time, they were spotted by the Spanish, captured and subjected to harsh imprisonment. Captain Stradling was subsequently sent to France for further sentencing. There are no records detailing the fate of the rest of his crew members. Captain William also faced less fortunate circumstances. Sued for the damages to the St. George and the Cinque Ports, he found himself in debt and labeled a failure. Although he avoided the harsh fate that befell Thomas, William died a broken man in 1715. Despite attempting to settle down and marry upon his return to England, Alexander found himself uneasy with the settled life. In 1717, he returned to the sea, this time as a member of the Royal Navy, becoming an officer involved in anti-piracy efforts.
Tragically, while on patrol off the coast of Africa, he contracted yellow fever and passed away on December 13, 1721. Reflecting on his years after leaving Massa Tierra, Alexander, despite the initial hopelessness of his first months on the island, looked back fondly on that time. He even expressed that, despite his wealth, he would never be as happy as he was when he was not worth a farthing. In the end, Alexander's decision to remain on the island proved to be the wisest choice of his life, saving him from harsh imprisonment and possible death. The journey initially marked by desperation evolved into a testament to human resilience and adaptability. Alexander not only survived, but found a unique sense of contentment in the simplicity of island life. What would you have done if you were in Alexander's shoes? Could you have survived the isolation on the island? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this incredible tale of survival, subscribe for more captivating stories from history where individuals triumph against the odds.